like to especially welcome those that are joining us online this morning. Maybe if it's my mom, if she woke up late um, to watch in St. Louis, I want to say welcome. But I also, we have a special welcome this morning because I received a text about 10 minutes ago that our middle school pastor and high school pastors, Mike Sheely and Matt Pineda, are watching the service online all the way from India as they lead a, a student conference. So everybody turn the camera and say hello to Mike and Matt. Now another just real quick comment, you might have noticed up here that typically when Pastor Chris preaches he has water. I have iced coffee, just one of the distinct differences. But someone from our online campus made an observation from last service about my iced coffee and I just wanna clear up for everyone. They asked, why do I have the Starbucks sippy cup lid and a straw in it? And so my, just to let you know, if I'm paying $3.40 and I'm gonna get a straw for it as well. So if you're wondering that, that is why. And I also, I had a turtle and I'm not as concerned about it. Our text for today is Philippians chapter three, verses seven to 14. If you wanna hold that, in your Bible, we're going to uh, read that in just a little bit. We are going to wrap up our sermon series, The Power of One, today. A few weeks ago, our children's and student ministry team sent out a parent survey because one of our strategies is to partner with parents in raising their kids and to better live out this strategy, we sent out a survey asking basically where do you need help? We listed a bunch of topics and just asked them to choose their top three. They included technology, bullying, anxiety, discipline, drugs, alcohol, vaping, cleaning your room, all kinds of things like that. After collecting close to 175 surveys, our team was shocked and we were taken a little by surprise about what topic came out on top for parents. It was a simple one word answer. The word was faith. In a crazy, busy, whirlwind scheduled world, how do we as parents live out and instill faith in the everyday lives of our kids? How do we incorporate faith into what we are already doing? And as I thought about that question, and as I thought about that survey, it really helped me to focus, it really helped me to shape a lot of the words that I wanna share with you today. So far we've talked about living with one purpose while we focus on our one love. And today we're gonna to talk about doing all of this one day at a time. So you might be one of those parents that listed faith at the top of the list, or maybe you've never ever had kids. I think we can all agree that there are times in our life when life is just crazy. Everything is going on around us, the schedules don't work, things aren't the way they should be, and life just seems chaotic and out of control. And yet there's those other days when everything goes perfect, so smooth, just as you had planned. If we as believers can commit ourselves to the singular pursuit of the things that matter most in our spiritual life, then our faith will be stronger and more productive. This series is really about intentional living or living on purpose. Because you know as well as I do, if we don't choose to live intentionally, day by day the calendar just slips by, the numbers move on and we're surprised every time we look. I'm sure most of you have been reminded about this on Facebook and been looked at some pictures that have come up on Time Hop. It reminds us of our life, how things used to be. We see a picture, we're like, that was one year ago today? That was two years ago? Or maybe even that was 10 years ago? Where did that decade go? I was reminded of this yesterday when I had a Time Hop come up in my life. And I was reminded that seven years ago yesterday was the day I purchased my shiny new brass Elvis belt buckle. <laughs> and so, if you ever wanna know when I bought that, it was seven years ago from yesterday. We have that to remind us how quick life moves on. 
We have a tendency at times to live as if today just doesn't count. We live as if we'll have another chance to do the things that need to be done, and we so today and other days, we just coast. But the Bible teaches us again and again that today is the day. I'm reminded in a scene of Dead Poet Society when Robin Williams whispers, carpe diem, seize the day. Today matters. As long as it's called today, it matters more than any day in your life. The bottom line is that we need to be committed to making the most of each and every day and doing so one day at a time. The Bible makes it clear that we have just one life to live. Hebrews 9, 27 says, each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment. In other words, there are no second chances. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. And then we get to our text today, the words of Philippians chapter three. The Apostle Paul writes these words. If you have your Bible with you today, an actual Bible, great job. If you have your device, that's also great job. If you didn't bring anything, you can follow along on the screen behind us. We're gonna ask you, if you would, to stand like we do each and every weekend. If you're a guest with us today, we do this each and every week because we so much respect God's word. And so I'm gonna ask if you would to follow along with me as we read together Philippians chapter three, verse seven through 14. It says, but whatever was my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. And so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have been already made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win a prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You may be seated. And we always ask God to add to the blessing of reading his word. Together this morning, I would love it if we looked at three ways from this text that can apply to our lives so that we can live out our faith each and every day, one day at a time. If you're taking notes, you can follow along in the bulletin as we go. The first one, next to the first, you can write down, we need to put the past in the past. We need to put the past in the past. And I imagine this goes without saying, but a lot of people have a hard time letting go of the past. This especially is true when it comes to mistakes, hurtful things, or hurtful words that have been said to, or things that have been done to us. Let me show you what I mean. In my lifetime of sports, these figures stand out, and I'm curious as to what your reactions will be, because I imagine in this room there are going to be people or individuals that are very passionate about some of the teams that I show up on the screen. The first one happened in October of 1986. Here's a picture of Bill Buckner as the ball goes between his legs in game six of the NLCS. And ultimately, they lose that game and lose that series. And for years and years and years, he is forever remembered as the one who let it get away and prolonged the curse of the Red Sox. Perhaps this one is memorable for you. I remember exactly where I was in 1993, the, of April of 1993, I was in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Here there's a picture of Chris Webber calling a timeout. In the final game of the NCAA championship, he didn't have a timeout to call, and they turned the ball over 
and he was blamed for years for costing them a chance to win the championship. Or probably the one that's gonna be the most painful for some of you in this room, and I apologize first for the team, but secondly for your pain. <laughs> this, October of 2003, Steve Bartman interfered with a fly ball that could have gotten the Cubs one step closer to their first World Series title in 100 billion years, or whatever <laughs> it was. Again, I'm sorry for your team. Guys, that's just sports. That's just a game, just a silly game. What about relationships? When things happen to us, we don't forget. We hold on to them, we don't move on. The words we remember, we remember everything when it comes. We have to put the past in the past. Hanging on to the past makes it impossible for us to focus on anything productive in the present. Well, here's the thing. It is not always the negative things from the past that we hold on to. Sometimes we live in the past because we imagine how much greater life was when. And we look back and we think how things used to be and all the time that's happening, we lose sight of what's happening today right in front of us. And I'm sure all of you have a story, you can look back at some point in your life and you can reminisce and be like, oh, those were the days, those were the good old times. I can relate to that because when I was a sophomore in college, I started off my year by purchasing a two-year-old manual transmission Ford Probe. If you are unfamiliar with the Ford Probe, let me fill you in on some of the details. It was Ford's finest hour. <laughs> they had never done it that good up to that point and they've never done it that good since. It was a two-door little sports car. It was the love of my life. I loved that car more than just, well I mean my girlfriend at the time, Lisa, I loved her just a little bit more, but not much. I loved that probe. Well, when I got married, the probe went away, and I graduated to, for the next 14 years, a Ford Festiva. That was not Ford's finest moment. If you are unfamiliar with the Ford Festiva, it's the equivalent of going to the dealership and saying, I want car. <laughs> they give you that. So, for 14 years, I constantly lived in the past, and I remembered the good old days. Here's another reality, church. Churches do the same thing. We look at our past, and we're like, do you remember when? Do you remember when we used to have revivals? I remember the tent in the 103 degree weather. It was awesome. Or I remember when we used to have Wednesday night church and Sunday night church. I remember when we used to have pews instead of chairs. Oh, the good old days. Or if you're a middle school parent, I remember when our middle school children worshiped in the chapel instead of going all the way across the street. If you're a parent of a middle schooler, you know that history repeats itself. And we started this weekend back up in the chapel because of the four-way stop remembering life how it used to be. One of my favorites is when people would come up to me, they don't do it as much as they used to. They'd go, Chris, do you remember Vacation Bible School? <laughs> hey, do you know we built a boat across the street? We built Noah's Ark. Did you know that? We were on Good Morning America. Chris, do you remember? No. I, I do have the VHS copy of the original footage if anyone wants to borrow that and kind of reminisce how things used to be. The reality is we need to move and put the past in the past because if we don't, we're gonna miss what's right in front of us, those opportunities to live out faith each and every day. And I really feel like these are where the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, 7 can make a difference. He writes, but whatever was my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness to know Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. 
Paul did not consider everything in his history bad, but he said everything compared to knowing Christ means nothing. Paul was in a unique position where he had earned the right to speak to those that day. He wasn't just walking the walk, or he wasn't just talking the talk, he had walked the walk. He was a devout, devout Hebrew, circumcised at eight days old. His family had never intermarried outside of the tribe of Benjamin. He had retained the original Hebrew language, which was not common in the day, because so many other Jews had intermarried and had lost that, so he could speak in the original Hebrew tongue. He had been one of the Pharisees, who at any given time, there were no more than 6,000 Pharisees ever. He had trained at the feet of Gamaliel, the high priest. And he had all of that, and he said, all of this is nothing compared to knowing Christ, to compared to knowing Jesus. And the term that the Apostle Paul uses for rubbish is a borderline Greek bad word. So teens, I'm gonna teach you a bad word today in Greek. It is the word skubala. He uses that to emphasize the, the severity of how everything is compared to Christ. It's so bad compared to a life with Christ. Everything else is rubbish or trash. He goes on to use language that is like bookkeeping terms. He uses words like profit and gain, describing one side of a ledger as loss. When Paul uses the first sentence, he says it this way. The translation from Greek of the original word that he uses, where he says, I consider everything, that word everything, is translated plural. And that's very important. It's like the Apostle Paul looks at all of his achievements and he counts them one by one by one. Look at me, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I've accomplished this. And he says everything's listed in a group as if he counted them one by one by one. But then he goes on to say, consider, I consider all things a loss. Then it changes over to singular. It's as if Paul no longer remembers the individual achievements or the individual accounts, but lumps everything together into one big pile and moves them as one. It's so Paul measured his treasures individually, but then he discards the whole stack as one compared to Christ. It reminds me of one of my favorite shows to watch, American Pickers. You'll see these guys that will go in and yet they will encounter families who have amassed a collection over decades and decades and decades. And you can tell that each of the hundreds or thousands of items, each one has a story. Each one has a, a, a history. It's like I remember in 1973 went to this auction and I picked this up. But then at the very end, there are some times when families, whether it be the loss of a, a loved one or some other family situation, they, it loses its value. And they just wanna move the whole collection. Everything is one. The individual value is gone, and now it just needs to be moved as one. That's what the Apostle Paul says is our life before we know Christ. Here's the thing. If you want your life to move forward in a way that honors God, then make a decision daily to move forward in a way that honors God and put the past in the past. When I first heard the title of this message, I immediately thought of the TV show, One Day at a Time. It came from the early 70s and into the 80s. I remember just a few characters from the show, but I don't remember a lot of the storyline because I think I was about two years old when it came out and that wasn't a show I was watching at the time. But I looked it up online, I looked it up in our history books, if you will, and got a little more backstory on the, the, the show one day at a time. It's based around Bonnie Franklin's character who moved from Logansport, Indiana to Indianapolis, Indiana after a bit of a messy divorce and she has two teenage daughters that she brings with her. And the reason it's titled that is because she's just trying to survive one day at a time. Now I do remember the song, and I was going to sing it to you, but last week Pastor Chris sang a song in his sermon, so I didn't wanna to try to one-up him and sing one day at a time, so I'm not going to sing the song to you today. 
But I do want to read some of the words of the song. It says this, this is it, this is life, the one you get, so go and have a ball. Straight ahead and rest assured, you can't be sure at all. Keep on doing what you're doing and hold on tight one day at a time. We need to put the past in the past. I am reminded of the Old Testament words from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 to 19. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. If you're taking notes, write down next to number two. Embrace the opportunities of the present. Embrace the opportunities of the present. Verses 12 and 13 says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining on toward what is ahead. As I really thought about a way to visualize and illustrate this point about embracing the opportunities of the present, as well as at the end of verse 13 when it says, forgetting what is behind and looking ahead, I didn't have to look any further than my own hometown of St. Louis. I love sports. I really love St. Louis sports, thus the Cubs reference. I really, really, really love the St. Louis Blues. And last service, I I said that, and I had a few people whispering, it's their hockey team, in case you were were wondering. Some of my very earliest memories are going to hockey games with my father. For over 40 years, I've watched and ultimately been disappointed with the end of each season. Forgetting what is behind and straining on towards what is ahead, I will have to admit, I never, ever, ever thought I would live to see them win at all. My youngest son, however, Eli, never, ever, ever gives up on the blues. Never. He's like 10 times the St. Louis blues fan than I ever was, ever. He always thinks and always believes, okay, they're down six nothing. Okay. They just need seven goals. They can do this. Okay, they're 50 points out of the playoffs. They got this. They're gonna win the Stanley Cup this season. He really believes every single game they're gonna win, every single season, they're going to have ultimate victory at the end. Wouldn't it be great to live life like that? Where you don't care about history, you don't care about what's behind you, but you know and you have your eyes on the prize and you are so convinced despite whatever is going on around you, you're gonna win. You have a victory to live. I want a faith like that. I want a faith that points in that direction. Well, to finish up the Blues story, in January, the St. Louis Blues were tied for last place, 32 out of 32 teams. And if you're keeping score, that's not good. That's very bad. And they very well could have just relied on, for 51 seasons we've lost, 52 years have went by, we're in last place, another one gone, yet they didn't. They embraced the opportunity around them, the players and the coaches. And if you fast forward to June of that year, which happened to be the week of church camp, wouldn't you know it, They won it all, and they raised the Stanley Cup. That never would have happened if the players and coaches had looked behind them and said, the season is lost, there is no opportunity around us. All the decades of failed expectations, they didn't do it. They embraced the present reality. And as I tell you that story, how many of you have a history like the St. Louis Blues? Decades and decades of disappointment failed expectations, a history of defeat. We have to put the past in the past. We have to embrace those opportunities that are around us today. In a sermon series titled The Power of One, we can't ignore those words of the Apostle Paul. When he says in verse 13, he says, the one thing I do, the one thing, which is forgetting what is behind me, pointing towards ahead. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 34 says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 18, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. When it comes to living out our faith one day at a time, what opportunities are right in front of us each and every day? Let's go back to the example that I opened with about that parent survey. What does it mean as a parent to live out our faith with our kids each and every day? How can we do that in this world? And actually, it's pretty simple. So if you expected a pie chart up here about how to divide your time or lots of different resources, I'm gonna give you a really simple answer about how to do that. We need to incorporate our faith into what we are already doing with our kids. Because I could stand up here and say, parents, here's the answer. You need, as a, as a family, to have a one-hour Bible study every day. That's gonna transform the lives of your kids. You might try that one time and realize that isn't gonna work. I don't have an hour to just sit down and do that. I don't have that because life is so busy and crazy. But if you incorporate faith into what you are already doing with your kids, it will make a difference one day at a time, slow and steady. When you get in the car, I know none of your children get on electronic devices. Just in case they do, when you get in a car, say to everyone in the car, we have an audience. I need two to three minutes until we get to destination here to just tell you a story, tell you about my faith, tell you about history, tell you about something that happened, something great God did in my life, a way that God showed up, a way that God answered a prayer. Here's something I've been praying for that hasn't been fulfilled yet, God hasn't answered yet in my life. You have an audience with your kids. Use that time. When you sit down at a meal, talk about faith. Use that time. When your kids go to bed, those few moments when they're going to bed, sit down, pray with them, teach them how to pray. Not just what to pray, teach them how to pray. Involve them in what you're already doing each and every day. Embrace the opportunities that are in front of us. We can do that in our lives even if we don't have kids, even if our kids are grown, we can find ways to incorporate faith in everyday life. If you're taking notes, write down next to number three. Never stop looking above. Philippians 3.14, translated in the King James Version, we're going way back with this translation. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. I love how that's worded. The high calling in Christ Jesus. In the first week of our series, we talked about living in the power of one purpose. We talked about the truth that God has called to make our lives count by discovering the purpose for our lives, which, I'll add, we can do one day at a time. Here's the deal. God calls us to stretch, to reach, to live a life that is beyond us. And then the Apostle Paul uses a word to describe that which is a very vivid, very specific, very intentional word. And I'm gonna attempt to sound it out to you because it's been about 25 years since I've studied Greek. So all of you Greek scholars just know I am going to pronounce this incorrectly and I'm okay with it. The word is this, ep epicane ominous. It's like this long, try saying it three times fast. The word is used to describe a racer going hard for the tape. It describes him as his eyes on nothing but the goal. Describes him almost clawing the air, head turned back, body bent forward, going for the ultimate prize. The Greek term translated goal literally means means goal marker, and it's found nowhere else in the New Testament. The prize is not defined, but would include everything beyond the constraints of this life in the presence 
of our Heavenly Father. The race is not described as just one runner running, but many. And there's not just one prize, but the end or a goal. It's much in the same way as a modern marathon, and I'm sure you've all seen them. The race for most marathon runners is not to win the race. There are some of those. But most of them, their goal is what? To get to the end, to finish the mark. And if you do, you get a cool prize. You get this ribbon and you get this medal that says, I have completed a race. So I wanna show you a picture that I am really proud of from just a few years ago. This is a picture of Disney Marathon 2007. Uh, and the reason I am so proud of that picture is because I knew exactly who to ask so that I could borrow that medal <laughs> to take that picture in. So the Gavorskis, thank you. I wanna thank Mark for letting me use that. Because I'm smart enough to know I will never, ever, ever earn one of those by myself. The goal is to get to the end and finish the race. Another way to look at it is a lot like graduation. The goal is to get to the end. Graduation is something I do have a little bit of experience with. It all started for me in kindergarten. I remember kindergarten graduation. I made it through coloring. That was exciting. <laughs> and then a few other graduations as they went on. And just a few months ago, we had the graduation of our oldest son as his name was read when he came across the stage, had completed a journey. God had a unique calling for the Apostle Paul who wrote the words of our text. He called him to be a spokesman for the Gentiles. And if you remember back a few verses, Paul said, forgetting what is behind you, and this included his history, his, his, any rituals or background. He says, it doesn't matter who you were born from, who your parents are, or where you've come from. Jesus is calling all of us heavenward and has opened that door. He understood the significance of that. He also understood that it was important to have a close personal relationship with Jesus at the foundation and doing so one day at a time. In our text, Philippians 3.12, it says, not that I have already obtained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. It is important to know that when the Apostle Paul says made perfect, he is not referring to a state of sinlessness, but the idea of completion or maturity. The same term in verse, in verse 15 is translated as mature. Philippians 3 verse 13 says, brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining on toward what is ahead. Two different times the Apostle Paul writes, I press on, or the idea of straining or reaching. There may be things that God is calling us to do that we think are impossible, but we keep looking above and we press on. There may be obstacles in our path that seem impossible to overcome, but we keep looking above and we press on. This is a significant part of the Christian life. Make the most of each day and make your life count when you reach beyond and live a life beyond you. That's what God wants for our lives. In 1960, Dashrath Manji was a common laborer in India. His community was somewhat remote with limited access to vital services because traveling invited, involved going around a 300-foot mountain that stood between the towns. Dashrath decided that what his community needed most was a road through the mountain. And since no one else was gonna do it, he decided he would. So he sold some goats to buy a hammer and a chisel and he set out to chip away at the mountain each and every day after work. Of course, people said he was crazy and the project would never be completed, but he just kept chipping away with his hammer and his chisel. 1960, chipping away. 1961, chipping. 62, 63. Fast forward a couple decades into 1980, he was still chipping away. 1981, still chipping, and in 1982, the project was complete. There was a road 30 feet wide and 25 feet high. Now instead of the villagers having to travel 55 kilometers around the mountain, people of the village only had to travel 15 straight through. What an example of reaching for what is beyond you. 
Part of living one day at a time is making our daily resolve to never stop looking up at God at the high calling he has for our lives. Then whatever we keep reaching for, we too press on. I want to read the remainder of that chapter for you in Philippians 15 through the end. It says this, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if some point you... If, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now I say it again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Christ Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lower bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And I want to close with this from chapter 4, verse 1, as a challenge to all of us. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And doing so, one day at a time, forgetting what is behind us, embracing those opportunities of the present, and keeping our eyes focused on him. Will you pray with me? Father God, we count it a privilege and an honor to be able to look into your word. We thank you for those words of the Apostle Paul. And we just pray that we look to you and that we can apply those words to our everyday life so that we can do so one day at a time and we can live out our faith and we can focus all of our love, all of our hope on you. We give you the honor, we give you the glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.